I'm Hug. This is the dice. As you can see, I've got a lovely new set. And, well, talking about today's topic, there's two very different versions of the devil in Irish folklore. In areas of Ireland that had a strong English presence or were traditionally wealthier, which were usually the same areas, the devil was portrayed as a roguish, suave, seductive gentleman, a member of the upper class. He was charming and well-spoken and very, very easy to talk to and make friends with. He would appear just before moments of great calamity often interrupting poker games. But the further you get into the countryside in Ireland, and the further away you get from wealth, the more the devil is depicted as, well, the winner of the 666th Upper Class Twit of the Year Award. The devil in working class stories, he's rather less suave, less sophisticated. He is directly after your soul or your life. He is predatory. He's depicted rather a lot in the same fashion as landlords would have been. The running theme in the working class depictions of the devil is that he is powerful and predatory, but that also he's a little bit daft and that all you really need to beat him is a little bit of bravery and a little bit of cleverness. I think it's pretty commonly accepted that most cultural groups take the awful things they have to deal with and turn them into the monsters of their folktales. So let's have a quick look at what I think is happening with these two versions of the devil. The devil of the upper class is a rogue, a rake, a spiteful troublemaker, but still a charming upper class socialite. That's an idea reflected in very real historical figures from Ireland, such as Richard Parsons, founder of the Irish branch of the notorious Hellfire Club, or another Richard, Richard Byrne Chapel Whaley, who got his nickname because of his hobby of setting chapels on fire as a joke. These men were known to be quite suave and debonair, but were also infamous for their debauchery, cruelty, and fascination with the occult. And many stories about them literally involve the devil. So it makes sense that the devil their peers told stories about would reflect characteristics of those men. But what about the devil of the working classes? Well, other more prominent YouTubers, such as HBomberGuy and especially Maven of the Eventide, have talked about how vampires and their sucking of blood was often a metaphor for how the ruling class leeches the money and life out of the workers. And I think we have a similar idea with the devil of the working class, with the souls of the poor standing in for their blood as the metaphor for money and labor. The main difference, of course, between the stories about vampires and stories about the devil from the working class poor of 19th century Ireland is that the devil stories have much less of a sense of hopelessness and horror. I don't know whether this is an innate optimism of the working class of Ireland or just a way of hiding the fear and making people feel better about the situation that they were in, the situation they felt they couldn't fully escape. Personally, I think both of these depictions of the devil are trying to show the same thing. The upper class depictions show the devil as one of their own who has turned to evil. Suave, sophisticated, charming, fully capable of tricking or beguiling anyone. The working class are also trying to depict the devil as upper class, predatory, powerful, always trying to trick people and take what they have, but ultimately not clever and wily enough to fool the working classes. There's actually very few shared characteristics between these two depictions of the devil. The devil of the upper classes is perpetually well-dressed and well-spoken. Not usually there to steal souls, just to cause trouble in dramatic ways. He's usually able to disguise everything but his cloven hooves. The devil of the working classes, however, is rarely in disguise. He is red-skinned and horned, 
with hooves and goat's legs. He is there to steal souls and to punish the poor with very little charm. He's often seeming angry or impatient. What is shared is the inability of the devil to cross holy objects or symbols. In the stories from the upper classes, this is nearly always made use of by pastors, priests, ministers, but in the stories from the working classes, this is usually made use of not by members of the clergy, but by ordinary people. And not just to trap or dismiss the devil, but to utterly humiliate him as well. I'm sure you've already noticed what's interesting here is that both the upper class and the working class have been depicting the devil as upper class, but clearly have very different opinions on what that means. We're going to do something unusual in this video. I'm going to give you two different stories about the devil from Irish folklore, one from an upper class perspective and one from a working class perspective. Try to guess which one's which. Fado, Fado. There was a big house near Selbridge called Castle Town House. This house was very famous for having 361 windows. Though now it has one less, because at the time it wasn't considered proper to have more windows in your home than the King of England. I'm sure you've already guessed which story this is. It was a Lord Connolly who lived in this house and he loved to hunt. One day he was mounting his horse preparing for a hunt and he turned to his butler and he said, I could hunt with the devil himself. And then he rode off into the forest. As he was riding through the woods between the trees, he came upon a man, a very well-dressed man, riding alongside him without a word who would help him in his hunt, help pursue and corner his quarry. When they were done, Lord Connolly invited the stranger back to his home for tea. As they drank their tea and ate biscuits and cake, they decided to start playing cards. Lord Connolly, he was utterly charmed by his new companion and invited him to stay for dinner. As they were eating, Lord Connolly dropped his fork upon the ground, and his butler bent to pick it up, and as he did so, he noticed that Lord Connolly's new friend had cloven hooves. Now, naturally, the butler was taken aback by this. He stumbled backwards, exclaiming that Lord Connolly's guest was the devil himself. Lord Connolly said this was ridiculous until he saw the cloven hooves as well. He shouted at the stranger to leave his house immediately. But the man only sat back in his chair, his cloven hooves crossed upon his legs, and he laughed. Lord Connolly, he sent for a Protestant minister to come and exorcise the devil from his home. The minister did his best Performing the exorcism as best as he could, he sweated through seven shirts in his efforts. But finally, he left all the while the devil had only been laughing at him. Eventually, reluctantly, Lord Connolly takes the advice of his butler and sends for a Catholic priest. A young priest arrives at the door. When he comes in, he looks around. He hangs his hat upon the chimney guard, he hangs his coat at the front door, and he leaves his stick in the windowsill. And he begins to perform the exorcism. But the devil, the devil runs to the chimney and he says, remove your hat so I can leave by the chimney. And the priest says no. The devil runs to the door and says, please remove your coat so I can leave by the door. And the priest says, no. The devil runs to the window and says, please remove your walking stick 
so I may leave by the window. And the priest says no. You may only leave by the hearthstone, which will return you to hell. There's a tremendous bang and a flash of light. The hearthstone cracks in two, and the devil turns into a plume of smoke, which vanishes through the crack, returning to hell. What's interesting about this story is that it ended up being a Catholic priest, a representative of the religion of the working classes of the native Irish, who ended up solving the problem and not the Protestant minister, a representative of the ruling upper classes, the British descended col colonists. This is a common theme in colonial folklore from around the world. Supernatural problems are usually solved by native practitioners when the conventional wisdom of the civilized world fails. You see this in relation to Native Americans in particular. Now, I fully believe this is done as a ham-fisted moral on not dismissing other cultures, but in practice, it does more to exoticize and other the colonized peoples than it does to teach people to value them. Thankfully, the Republic of Ireland is no longer a colony, so we here don't have to worry about that as much as others who are still having to deal with colonizers. Let's move on to another story. Fado, Fado. There was a very poor man named John. He and his wife had no farm or animals of their own, and it was very hard for them to earn money. John would often walk across the countryside looking for work, odd jobs that he could do for a little bit of extra cash. One day he was going on such a walk, and he was crossing a bridge, and as he was crossing it he was very tired, he was exhausted, and it was a steep bridge, and he said to himself, May the devil take me if I ever cross this bridge again. After he passed the bridge, he carried on his way until he met a beggar. He gave the beggar one of the three shillings in his pocket, and the beggar told him to make a wish. So John said, The sack on my back, I wish that whoever I asked to get into it would have to get into it. And the beggar said, Well, that's done then. The sack will do that. And so John, he carried on on his way. He hadn't walked too far before he came across a second beggar. So John gave this beggar the second of his two shillings. And the beggar told him to make a wish. And so John said, I have a special bottle at home. I wish that whoever I told to get into it would have to. And the beggar said, well, that's done then. And John, he carried along on his way. And he kept walking for a while until he came across a third beggar. He gave this beggar the last of his three shillings. And the beggar told him to make a wish. So John says, there's an apple tree in my back garden. And I am sick of people stealing the apples. I wish that when somebody touched one of those apples or touched any part of that tree, they would be stuck to the tree and not be able to come loose until I gave permission. Well, that's done then, said the beggar. And John carried on for a little while until he finally decided he was too exhausted and there was no more work he was going to be able to get done. So he turned around and he went back the way he came, ready to head home. But as he crossed that bridge again, the devil appeared in a puff of flame. He was huge, imposing, red-skinned, horned with goat's legs. And he said, John, I am here to break your neck like you asked. And John, thinking very quickly, 
took the sack off his back and told the devil to get inside it. And of course, because of the wish the first beggar had granted, the devil got in the sack. John carried along on his way and he found two old women doing their laundry by a lake. And they were beating their laundry with laundry bats, which were a thing in the 19th century. You'd clean your laundry by beating it in the water. And he said, could the pair of you please help clean my sack for me? So they took his sack and they put it in the water and they beat it and beat it over and over again with their bats, with the devil inside it. John thanked them for cleaning his sack and he took it and he carried on on his way home until he came to a blacksmith. And he went into the blacksmith and he said, I want you to take your hammer, put this sack on your anvil and then beat the sack with the hammer as much as you can. So the blacksmith did. He put the sack with the devil inside it on his anvil and he beat it with the hammer as hard as he could. Eventually, a hole was torn in the sack. The blacksmith looked and he could see the devil's eye pressed up against the hole. So he took a red hot poker from the fire and jammed it through the hole into the devil's eyeball. Which is why the devil is now blind. The devil turned into a puff of smoke and escaped through the hole. Two years later, the devil shows up at John's house. John says, look, I'm ready, I'll go with you, you can break my neck like I promised. But first, I'd really love one last apple from the tree out the back. So the devil went to get John a tree from the apple tree in the back garden. But because of that third wish that John had made, the devil was stuck to the tree. And John left him stuck to that tree for seven years. Until one day his wife was cold and she wanted wood for the fire. So she chopped down the branch that the devil was stuck to and the devil went free. So the next day the devil comes back for John and John says, oh yeah, I'm ready. Would you like to come in for a drink of tea first? So the devil goes into the house with John and John, he picks up his bottle a special bottle he'd made the wish on, his second wish, and he tells the devil to get inside. And he closes the bottle, and it stood there on the table with the devil inside it for seven years, until the cat knocked it off the table by mistake, and the bottle shattered, and the devil, in a puff of smoke, vanished and went back to hell. Not long after this, John's wife became pregnant they couldn't find anyone to be the godfather. Finally, the day of the baby's birth came and they still hadn't found a godfather. So John went out onto the road to look for someone to be the child's godfather. Now first, he came across God. And God said he'd love to be the child's godfather. But John said, no, no, I don't think you're right. Next, John ran into death. Death said that if John would give him his life, he would be the child's godfather. And John agreed. So they went to the baptism and death was a wonderful godfather in the ceremony. And the next day death came for him and said, John, it is time to go. And so John left with death. And they went up to heaven and God said, Oh no, I'm not having John in here. I have volunteered to be his child's godfather and he said no, he cannot come into heaven. So death, he takes John down to hell. And when they reach hell, the devil says, I am not having John in here. He's tricked me so many times, I won't allow it. And so death had no other choice but to allow John to remain on earth. That happened oh, about 200 years ago. John is still alive to this day because neither heaven nor hell will have him. So yeah, this is pretty different to that first story. 
The devil is repeatedly tricked and humiliated and accidentally helps his victim and tormentor become immortal. But that's fairly characteristic of devil stories from rural Ireland. The devil is nearly always tricked repeatedly and pretty much always comes off the worse. I find this really stark difference between the upper class and working class devil stories very, very interesting, as you probably guessed from the beginning of the video and how much I was waxing lyrical about it. I think a lot of what it comes down to is one set of people are romanticizing the devil, the other are not. I think it's really interesting to take note of these differences in folklore on the same subject. Not just between different regions, different countries, different language groups, but between different classes, uh, especially different social and economic classes. I think that says a lot about the culture of the time and the relative culture between the two classes and how they perceive things, how they look at things like good and evil. Though, of course, the upper class devil and the working class devil, they're both just both groups dealing with the kind of the kind of problem, the kind of human monster that they would generally deal with in their day to day lives. Better to talk about the devil you know, I suppose. Wow, okay, this is this was a long video. I got this idea because I noticed from Tales from the Shadows re retweeting that uh, a lot of people were doing devil-related stuff lately. They did an episode on their podcast, Sounds from the Shadows, about devil stories from around the world. Uh, Philosophy Tube did that recent video about Jordan Peterson, where he was the devil. Philosophy Tube was, not Jordan Peterson. Uh, and Cryptid Keeper did an episode on Crossroad Devils, so I figured, hey, why not jump on that bandwagon? And then it took me about a month to actually get the video done, because I have a lot of work to do. Now, don't worry, I'm not forgetting the Hellfire Club video, I'm not. It's just getting there, getting to a place where it's reasonable to walk up to the Hellfire Club takes about two hours from Dublin City Centre, so maybe two hours on a bad day if traffic's bad. Then it takes us about 40 minutes to get into Dublin from where we live. And then it's a good hour and a half hike still up to the Hellfire Club itself. I just have not had the time to invest in doing that. It's like I'd have to invest a good six hours and I just have not had six hours all at once to invest in it. So what I'm going to do, I've decided, fuck it, we're just at some point going to get a fucking taxi to the actual hill itself and then hike the last little bit ourselves. So it'll be much shorter and I'll be able to get that done. We're going to do that very soon. Uh, other announcements, other announcements. As you've seen, as I mentioned, lovely new set. This is partially down to... Uh, LARP house as moving in and and buying some nice color changing lights that both of us use for our filming. This is also partially down to me going fuck it. Um, I have money now. I'm gonna make a really cool looking set. So yeah, that's that's why there's a really cool looking set now. Yeah, I, I've always wanted to to be filming these in a room that looks like it's part of a dilapidated mansion that's slowly sink sinking into the bog, and now I can. I'm also a uh, Patreon. Patreon, we've got a Patreon update. I'm adding a goal. We're nowhere near achieving it, but when we get to a thousand dollars a month, I am going to do a live show. I'm going to organize myself, a bunch of storytellers, uh, folklorists, a venue, some musical support, and we are going to do a live show in Dublin, probably the Sugar Club, depending on what we can get. It's gonna be fun. It's gonna be really cool, uh, provided we ever hit a thousand dollars a month. Well, of course, I need to give thank you to everyone, uh, my patrons, and, and, and those of you who are kind enough to support me. I've just realized I don't have 
a list of the patrons who I'm supposed to be thanking here in front of me like I usually do because I have not been making videos as regularly so I've forgotten to do that. I'm probably gonna edit this down severely because I'm just looking for my patron list now. Just just looking for that 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 patron list. Here it is. There there it is. It's it's here. And and I'm just waiting for that to come on load and and there Okay, uh I would like to thank all of my current patrons, including Neil McConvera and all of the names you see on the screen below, as well as all of the others, everyone who's subscribed to this channel, likes my videos, shares my videos, comments on the videos, tweets or retweets me, that's really fun, I love interacting with people on Twitter, and yeah, all of you, you're just all great, it's really cool, thank you all. And remember, your applause, it's the only way, the only way to counteract my daily chant if I don't believe in fairies.